pop. 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 Hi, my name is Tom Slay, and the um, poem I want to read, my companion in the ether, would be uh, Wilfred Owen, uh, the World War I poet. And the uh, poem that I'm going to read is called Exposure. Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that knife us. Wearied, we keep awake because the night is silent. Low, drooping flares confuse our memory of the salient. Worried by silence, sentries whisper, curious, nervous, but nothing happens. Watching, we hear the mad gusts tugging on the wire, like twitching agonies of men among its brambles. Northward, incessantly, the flickering gunnery rumbles far off like a dull rumor of some other war. What are we doing here? The poignant misery of dawn begins to grow. We only know war lasts, rain soaks, and clouds sag stormy. Dawn, massing in the east, her melancholy army, attacks once more in ranks on shivering ranks of gray, but nothing happens. Sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence, less deathly than the air that shudders black with snow, with sidelong flowing flakes that flock, pause, and renew. We watch them wandering up and down the wind's nonchalance, but nothing happens. Pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. We cringe in holes, back on forgotten dreams, and stare snow dazed deep into grassier ditches. So we drowse, sun-dozed, littered with blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses. Is it that we are dying? Slowly, our ghosts drag home, glimpsing the sunk fires, glows with crusted dark red jewels. Crickets jingle there. For hours, the innocent mice rejoice. The house is theirs. Shutters and doors all closed. On us, the doors are closed. We turn back to our dying. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn, nor even suns smile true on child or field or fruit. For God's invisible spring, our love is made afraid. Therefore, not loath, we lie out here. Therefore, we're born. For love of God seems dying. Tonight, this frost will fasten on this mud and us, shriveling many hands, puckering foreheads crisp. The bearing party picks and shovels in shaking grasp, pause over half-known faces. All their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. The reason I told, chose this poem um, is because Wilfred Owen served in the First World War as a kind of soldier slash conscientious objector. And he wrote poems uh, very much against the war. And he was called a conscientious objector, but with a very seared conscience. 
And the seared conscience part of it comes in, of course, because he opposed the war, but he felt that the only way in which he could speak against it was to be an active participant in it. And that kind of double understanding of his role and what the role of protest could be is one of the things that I've always loved about him. He had a kind of suicidal courage. And that also is one of the things that I've been very interested in. Uh, the poem I want to read is a different kind of poem in the sense that it came out of doing some journalism in the uh, Middle East just after the 2006 war between uh, Israel and Lebanon. And I went there about a year after the conflict uh, to see what was left of the south of Lebanon. And one of the things that happened when I got there was a mini civil war broke out. And I had never really been in a war zone. Um, so this was my first experience of what Wilfred Owen was totally accustomed to. And naturally, I wasn't a direct combatant, so I have to write about the experience a lot differently than he did. In the poem, I have to go to a, and in real life, I had to go to a command post to get clearance to go further south into Lebanon, and I walked across a, a, t a yard full of tanks, and it was very strange because there were lots of shadows moving on the tanks, which didn't seem right. And I noticed, and this was the difference between the Lebanese army and the United States army, is that there were cats, hundreds of them, feral cats, lounging around on the tanks. And it's not the kind of thing you can put in a piece of journalism. So the poem's in three parts. Um, and it makes mention of uh, a cat goddess named Bas, the ancient Egyptian cat goddess who had wild festivals in her honor, in which everybody got very loose. And then um, this, the, the ending of the poem makes mention of a book of military strategy put together by an ancient Roman lawyer turned historian. And he has a whole section devoted to um, what he calls the strategies of barbarians. Over by the cemetery, next to the CP, you could see them in wild cat mint going crazy. I watched them roll in a wriggle, paw it, lick it, chew it, leap about, pink tongues stuck out, drooling. Cats in the tank squat shadows lounging, or sleeping curled up under gun turrets. Hundreds of them sniffing or licking long hind legs stuck into the air. Great six-toed brutes fixing you with a feral, slit-eyed stare. Everywhere ears twitching, twitching, as the armor plate expanding in the heat gave off piercing little pings. Cat invasion of the mind. Cat tribes running wild. And one big pregnant female comes racing through weeds to pounce between the paws of a marble dog crouching on a grave and sharpens her claws against his beard of moss before she goes all silky luxuriously squirming right under the dog's jaws and rolls over to expose her swollen belly. Picture her with gold hoop earrings and punked out nose ring like the cat goddess bast, bronze kittens at her feet, the crowd drinking wildly, women lifting up their skirts as she floats down the Nile, a sistrum jangling in her paw then come back out of it and sniff her ointments, lady of flame, eye of raw. Through the yard, the tanks come gunning, charioteers laughing, goggles smeared with dust and sun, 
Scattering the toms, slinking along the blast wall, holding back the waves from washing away white crosses on the graves. The motors roaring through the afternoon like a cat fuck yowling on and on. The gun turrets revolving in the cat's eyes swivel and shine, steel treads clanking, sending the cats flying in an exodus through brown brittle grass, the stalks barely rippling as they pass. After the last car bomb killed three soldiers, the Army website labeled them martyrs. Four civilians killed at checkpoints, three on the airport road, a young woman blown up by a grenade. Facts and more facts, until the dead ones climb up out of the graves, gashes on faces, her faces blown away like sandblasted stone that in the boarded-up museum's fractured English leaves the onlooker riddled and shaken, nothing but a pathetic gaping. And then I remember the ancient archers frozen between reverence and necessity, who stare down the enemy, barbarians as it's told, who nailed sacred cats to their shields, knowing their foes outraged in their piety would throw down their bows and wail like kittens. What have you lost which poetry helped you find again? And the immediate answer that came to me was um, my body. Um, and I guess the re, re, uh, it, it's a difficult answer to have to give. Um, but there was a, um, a uh, since I've written about it, this isn't, you know, um, I don't know, revealing autobiographical information that people don't already know about who, you know, know my work. Uh, you know, for many, many years I've had a blood disease and I remember there was a certain point when I, when I got the blood disease uh, in my early 20s and I was writing poems at that time. And it's very interesting to me, it was sort of as if um, my life ended at 26 and started up again after that. Uh, I mean, I still have the blood disease and it's a very odd thing uh, that when you live with the knowledge of, you know, potentially your own death in a way that's quite immediate, that it really changes your perception of time, changes your sense of the future. Uh, it deeply transforms um, what it is you think uh, you value and you love, and it greatly simplifies certain things and makes other things horribly more complicated. But one of the things that it simplifies, I remember at a certain point I was quite ill, um, and I was thinking about, well, you know, if I don't make it, what would I most miss? And it came to me quite suddenly that what I would most miss was um, seeing things, hearing things. I would miss my senses. Uh, maybe it's because I don't have a, you know, very, I'm skeptical, deeply skeptical of, you know, what other people would call religious intuitions. I, I don't really have that kind of understanding or belief, or maybe I just um, express it in a different way. But it was amazing to me, I was staring through a window, looking at a big sunflower. Uh, it was like October, so most of the seeds had fallen out, and there was this huge lion-headed sunflower staring back at me like a single eye. And I thought, I would really miss that. I would deeply, deeply miss that, you know? And, and so 
one of the things then that I began to realize was that, you know, the stakes of poetry began to immensely rise for me in terms of what it meant in my daily life and in terms of what it could mean to other people. Um, because so much of being ill is being forced back into your physical body and so much of the culture is about divorcing yourself from your physical body. I don't say that, you know, I'm glad I um, went through some of the things I've been through. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a certain way in which the extremity of understanding that comes to you in moments of real illness pushes you to certain kinds of realizations that you couldn't possibly have had any other way. Of course, you can say that about almost any kind of experience that has, a, has an edge to it, childbirth and <coughs> a person's death and those kinds of really <coughs> formative, scary experiences. <coughs> um, and joyous ones, too, you know. And, and what interests me about how this question sort of provokes all this palaver, um, <coughs> in, in recent years, my um, health has really improved immensely. Um, God knows why, uh, but I don't really think about it much. I, I, to tell you the truth, um, denial is a very positive. <laughs> sort of way of handling your life under these circumstances. Um, so I don't really question it. But one of the things that I wanted to do when I was 26 was I, I had this kind of romance with experience in which I had started off as an anthropologist and then sort of become somewhat skeptical of anthropology for the simple reason that it was awfully very odd to like I mean, I did work in southern Mexico, and um, I would be among other anthropologists, uh, and, you know, you would see somebody from an Ivy League college dressed up, you know, like a Tzotzil Indian, and it was just bizarre. It made no sense to me. It seemed like a ridiculous affectation, and at the same time, the whole idea that you could actually insert yourself into another culture and understand it from the inside seemed, you know, even at that time, not very likely. <laughs> but the thing that I, I, I loved it about anthropology when I was doing it was just how embodied you were and how much in the moment you were. And so what happened is when I got ill, I, I couldn't take those kinds of risks anymore. But then about the last 10 years, my health has improved a lot. And I reached a certain point where I said, you know, I believed in poetry as a kind of bodily experience, which is one of the reasons why I love the Wilfred Owen poem, because of the, just the complete visceral nature of the sounds in the poem, and the fact that this unbelievably acrobatic performance is being you know, used in the service of talking about a kind of terrible spiritual stasis, uh, which would be perfectly understandable if you were in trench warfare where nothing moves and you sit there for days on end and then finally there's a terrible battle. So the thing that then suddenly came back to me was this real desire to like, well, what would it be like to be embodied other than just in the experience of writing poems and trying to make a certain kind of music in a poem that would completely you know, uh, fill your head, fill your ear, fill your mouth, uh, you know, fill your mind the way, say, late at night when you're hearing a uh, refrigerator hum, and it's the only sound in the room. So I got invited to go to um, Lebanon uh, by a group called the Trans Arab Unity Foundation. And I went there with some other writers. And I stayed on after they left. And one of the things I did was that's when I began to went south. and had this sort of experience, but while we were there, this, as I said, this mini civil war had broken out, and so there was lots of people being killed all around us, and of course, in, in a funny way, it was like, okay, I'm here, I'm totally embodied, you're completely, um, you know in a fact if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you could be blown up. So it was the oddest thing, you know? 
because you felt a total embodiment because of the presence of danger, and yet at the same time you weren't afraid. And what happened was that I lucked out in going down to the south because I happened to hire, just out of chance, a fellow who had worked for the Red Crescent. Um, and he asked me, well, where do you want to go? And I said, well, let's go down to, um, you know, some place that happened in the war, and why, why don't you choose? He said, well, okay, I'll take you down to a place called Kana. And I said, okay, and I was thinking, Kana, Kana, where I've heard that before. And I, I realized that it was, um, it was the place where Jesus worked the first miracle, where he changes water into wine. And there's this moment of real, really odd, um, well, you know, kind of faux pas during the miracle because the water gets changed into wine and then the, um, the master of the feast comes to the bridegroom and says, how come you served out the lousy wine first before Jesus got here with the really good stuff? And this is all going through my head as we're heading south past destroyed bridges and blown up highways um, and the sheer unlikelihood of myself being in this car talking to this guy about what he'd been through. Anyway, uh, a cut to the chase, he would basically was the first, one of the first responders into the village of Kana and a massacre had occurred there and Israeli defense forces bomb had gone astray or was dropped purposely. It's hard to say in these situations. Anyway, um, a civilian family had been almost totally, uh, well, was totally wiped out. And so he waited on the outskirts of the village until the Israelis let the Hezbollah militia know that uh, our bombing is over with. That's something people don't know, that there's these communications back and forth between adversaries. Um, and so then he went in and then he took me in to the village. Uh, it was a year after, so there was quite a lot of reconstruction, but still a tremendous amount of rubble lying around. And he took me from place to place to place. And then he told me in very graphic detail what he'd seen. And the point of the story and why I, I, I think I chose the question that I chose is that he had to... He found a, a child buried in rubble, and there was lots of smoke, and you couldn't see very well, and it was still, you know, uh, very early in the morning, so the sun hadn't come out. And he found a child, and he began to uncover the child uh, from the rubble, because she was buried up to the neck, and he got her uncovered up to the armpits. And then he reached under their armpits to pick her up, you know, like this, and he discovered that she'd been blown in half. And this was a dead child that he'd been trying to save all this time. And I was, you know, stunned. I'd never heard anything like that before. I'd never, you know, it was, it was the kind of thing that, you know, you immediately try to attribute to a bad movie or something, you know. And he told me the story, very level-voiced. And then, you know, I, I could tell that it had really this retelling it, it really disturbed him. And I said, hey man, you know, if this is just too disturbing, you know, we don't have to do this anymore. And he looked at me and he said to me, oh no, if you will tell my story, if you will tell my story, I will tell you what happened. And I was totally taken aback. I'd never felt that kind of commissioned before by any person. And of course, it's a very complicated thing to know how to tell somebody's story when you're outside of the culture, when you're outside of this kind of, you know, internet scene, quasi-familial hatred between, you know, what's going on between Israel and Palestine, you know, and, uh, and uh, Lebanese. So, but that's sort of to the side of it. I mean, knowing how to do it is a difficult other problem. But the thing that I was struck by was I never felt that before. And I said, okay, I'll tell your story. And, and, and at that moment, it was so interesting because, you know, when I'm thinking back on it now, um, 
It's almost as if like that person who I was at 26, you know, had this kind of meeting with this young man who was an engineering student who hadn't been back to this village in a year, you know, and he was probably a little younger than me, um, 23 years old. He was probably 23 and when I had this big rupture in my life at 26, it just struck me that, you know, these two parts of my life came together, but the second part, you know, if I would tell his story, and here I was, you know, in a certain sense, in a really deep way, trying to get my body back in the most, you know, I mean, the most literal way, not metaphorically, but going to a place that was potentially dangerous and then being there meant you don't have to, you know, you're taking a chance here and you're going to be out there and it's, you're going to be exposed and you're not going to be near medical care and all of those things you can depend on the United States if your health is vulnerable. And none of that mattered suddenly because I had this other commission and I felt a kind of great sense of, you know, um, Really, ever since that time, a quiet sense of kind of relief and liberation. Um, and, you know, just reading the question, you know, what had I lost, and then finding it again. Um, this happened about, you know, uh, f five years ago. And since that time, I've gone on and done, and done other things, and of course, the you know, the sensation has changed. You know, the, the idea that poetry will give you your body back is a, is a deep and abiding faith that I have. Um, but of course, it gets more complicated as you get older. <laughs> um, pop.